Alright, so now we're good. Okay. Okay, sounds good. And then it'll make a, like, a refile at the end, and then you airdrop to me, that'll be great. Okay. So I'll come out after. Okay, sounds good. Wait, I'll see one last question. Yeah. So, uh, I asked in the slide, but like for random forests, if you increase the number of trees, like that's, I understand how it de decreases in the, the variance. Mm -hmm. but, like, if you increase the number of trees, isn't that also decreased by asking for like over the trees? I feel like that shouldn't uh, be the case, but I can't think of why it wouldn't. Increasing trees. <laughs> it decreases variance and increases bias. It increases? Yeah, because the decision tree by itself has an nice bias, right? But random forest is, is biased because the trees are themselves are not as accurate as they because we're sampling the trees. Oh, so you're like compounding the accuracy of the Yeah, that's that intuition. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can start wherever. Nice. Oh, do we have a web browser going? Huh? Oh, do we have it? Is it up on the screen? Oh. Okay, there we go. I'm gonna sit down there. Sure. Um, you may want to just keep doodling on the screen so it doesn't block in case you need anything. Huh? Like yeah, yeah I, just, I need to write down answers. Oh, this sure. Slide. Go for it. Uh, okay, everyone, let's get started. Uh, so we're just gonna go over announcements. Project three is due tonight. Please fill out your evaluations for extra credit. Uh, this is some stuff about the final in terms of the reference sheet and the cheat sheets you're allowed. Um, yeah, I uh, hope the final goes well for you guys. So unfortunately, Raghavir and I are about to condense like nine lectures into one lecture, so we're going to have to move pretty quickly. So we will try, so we'll try taking questions, but we are going to be pretty pressed for time. I just wanted to like establish that right now. Uh, bearing all of that in mind, I guess we can begin. Oh. Um, okay, sure. Here we go. So I just want to give you a brief overview of modeling, which is a, something we focused on a lot in the second half of this class. It's all right if this doesn't make perfect sense right now because we're going to crystallize it with an example of a specific model after that. So with modeling, the general idea is that you already have data and you want to use data you have to be able to predict other things. So if you want to predict, let's say, someone's uh, weight based on their height, you should already have like a combination of height-weight pairs. And then based on some, someone, else's, uh, someone else's height, whose weight you don't know, you want to be able to predict weight. And obviously there are different models you could come, come up with to try to achieve the same thing, to predict the same thing. So the question becomes, how would you want to decide what the best model is? And to decide that, you basically want a loss function. You have a loss function that helps you evaluate how good your model is, and then you pick the model that gives you the lowest loss. This is something that we've seen throughout the second half of the class. Uh, now I want to give you a specific example of a model from like start to finish and I think it's best if we start off with the linear regression model. This is the data set we'd pre seen previously in lecture regarding cars and different attributes and what we wanted to predict was their fuel efficiency measured in miles per gallon, that's a little column in the blue box over there. Um, so I want to talk about what you already have seen in data 8, that's a uh, simple linear regression in the form y is equal to mx plus b. I'm um, assuming you guys are all familiar with this equation. Uh, y is your independent variable, x is your dependent variable, m measures your change in y for a change in x, and assuming that, uh, and then b, and the b term uh, counts for any y intercept you might have. So now this equation that you see uh, over here is literally the exact same equation. There's nothing different except the specific notation. And when we generalize beyond this form of linear regression, we're going to be using this notation. So I just want you guys to get familiar with this. So now a simple linear regression model is useful if you have one variable and you want to predict it using another variable. But in the case of our data set here, we have more than just one variable we want to use to predict our fuel efficiency, right? Like it's, we probably assume that horsepower is relevant, how old the car is relevant. We assume that most, if not all of these factors or features are relevant in making our predictions. So we want to include all of them. Unfortunately, our simple linear regression model doesn't help us do that. It can only work with one variable. This is when we want to um, generalize to multiple covariate linear regression. Covariates are basically just uh, what your x's are. So in y is equal to mx plus b, x was your singular covariate, but now we have multiple covariates, so we need to like refer to them separately. So um, 
um, multiple covariate linear regression is pretty similar to simple linear regression, like it's a very natural extension. In simple linear regression, you uh, your equation was defined just by the intercept and the relationship between your one, your independent variable and your dependent variable. But over here, you have multiple uh, independent variables or multiple covariates. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to find a slope for each of them. It's like if you had y is equal to mx plus b, you're trying to find a different m for each of your x's. And in terms of the specific notation of the class, you can see how this generalizes. Now, if you have lots of different features, this can be cumbersome to write, but you can also write our prediction in the case of simple linear uh, of multiple covariate linear regression as a dot product between two vectors. Your theta vector represents your model weights and your x vector represents all your covariates. To make this mathematically consistent, to make this mathematically possible, you do need to add like a one to the beginning of your x vector, no, uh, a one to the beginning of your x vector, and this does make more sense uh, in a second. So we've discussed what you would be doing for a single prediction. Like if I gave you a single singular observation, what you'd want to do is multiplied by your model weights and then that would be your prediction. But let's say we have our an entire data set we're going to use to train our model, right? So now the question becomes, we have all these different observations and we want to create a model that allows us to learn from our entire set and then use that to make our prediction. So that is known as our feature matrix. This is what like a feature matrix looks like. You can see it's just like our data set again. And all of this in the yellow box is like our feature matrix. Each row represents a singular observation. And then each column is a specific like attribute or dimension that we might use in our model. And in blue is what we're trying to predict. So our model is going to like learn that when we have these attributes, this is what our predicted variable turns out to uh, looks like. So that's what we're going to use to try to figure things out. Uh, this is just some general notation. Uh, nothing new here, but in case you're not completely sure uh, about notation, then this is a good slide to review. Now uh, I'm going to skip ahead like a little bit. So we already discussed when you want to pick a model, you use like a loss function. So if we're using like a square error loss function, which we generally do, then our average loss across the entire data set is represented with this equation. And now we want to minimize this loss. What do we want to minimize it with respect to? You want to minimize it with respect to theta because you can't change your model observations and what you're trying and you already have, uh, when you're training a model, you already have your predictions. So those are unchanging, those are immutable. What you can change is your model weights because that's what you're deciding. That's what the model comes up with. So we are gonna try to minimize our loss over here with respect to theta. And so what you would do in that case is you'd want to differentiate your law. You want to take the derivative of loss with respect to theta. And then you want to set that to zero. And then you'd want to do some math to actually get your theta. We're just going to skip ahead to the answer right now. So theta hat is like the optimal theta value that will minimize our, our average square error loss here. And I, I don't think you need to know the specifics of being able to derive this equation because like it uh, requires some uh, you don't need to worry too much about the specific derivation of the equation, but you should know this specific equation. Uh, now, if you look at this equation, there are certain conditions that must be met for our solution to actually make sense. And the one I'm focusing on is invertibility. If your feature matrix X isn't invertible, then the matrix product of X transpose X itself will not be invertible. And if that matrix product is not invertible, then you, if you can't take the inverse here, you won't be able to get the solution. So now we need to figure out, is there any way we can guarantee that our feature matrix will be invertible? And that is where, uh, th that's where the idea of feature engineering comes into play. Uh, any questions about what we've covered so far? Okay, that's good. So now let's move on to feature engineering. Now we've discussed two main kinds of variables in class, right? Quantitative variables and categorical variables. And sometimes categorical variables can still have like numeric values. Like if you're categorizing uh, someone's size, you could have like small, medium, large, or you could code that with numbers like one, two, three, but that wouldn't mean that large is uh, three times small, like large meaning three is not necessarily thrice the value of small, which is one. So bear in mind that uh, numeric categorical variables still need to be treated separately. In the case of quantitative variables, uh, it's not something I'm going to spend too much time on because I feel like it's easier and you guys will be able to pick that up yourself. Uh, 
But in addition to the variables we already have, like in the case of the MPG data set, we already had like acceleration and horsepower. So using features you already have, feature engineering involves possibly creating new features that help you with your predictions and help you minimize your loss. So a simple example of feature engineering is if you already have a, um, a specific feature, in that case you can try having, let's say if you had a simple linear model, like of just y is equal to mx plus b as we've discussed before, you could take your x and it's like square it and that could be a new feature. So you'd go from like a simple linear model to like a quadratic model. And uh, so that you, so you'd be creating a new feature wh while still using the same data. So you don't need new data to create new features. You can use the data you already have to create new qu features. And with quantitative uh, variables, it's a lot easier because over here, we're just defining a new variable x2 where x2 is equal to like x1 square. And then this is just our simple linear model that we just generalized to multiple covariates. We just need to now include a theta2 with our x2. We can also make it a little more complicated because rather than just relying on one feature that we manipulate, you can instead, you can instead work with multiple features and try combining them. So a pretty simple way of like combining features would be just like multiplying them or adding them. But this theory generalizes, like you could perform any kind of computational operation between multiple variables to like create, uh, multiple features to create a new feature, and then you just include that in your model. So we're now creating a feature x3 by taking the product of our two features x1, x2, and we include it in our model by assigning a model weight to it, theta3. So that's how feature engineering works with quantitative variables. But categorical variables require a little more ingenuity. Before we get into that, I'm just gonna give you some other techniques for quantitative variables. You can standardize them, like uh, subtract the mean, divide by standard units, for example, you saw then data eight. Log transformations, you covered that in discussion in case you wanna transform your data. If you have like exponents and you want to change like the, change your scales, you might wanna exponentiate your data or take a log transformation. If you want to measure how your values compare to a specific value you already have in mind. So you want to say if you were recording temperature which impure water boils, you want to compare that to like 100 degrees Celsius because that's what it really should be boiling at. So if you have a set value, you can also compare to that. So there are a bunch of different ways you can work around quantitative variables. Moving on with categorical variables, these can be a little trickier because our model, it doesn't directly interpret different categories. Like if you told a model to interpret small, medium, large, it wouldn't be able to inherently tell that there might be some kind of ordering between your different categories that might be relevant in your model. So instead, we resort to one-hot encoding in the case of categorical variables. In the specific example of our um, MPG data set, we saw that there was a categorical variable which talked about where the car originated from, be it um, the USA, be it from Europe, be it from Japan. So in the case of uh, one-hot encoding, if the car did come from USA, we'd put, we, uh, so if there are N categories, we create N columns. So over here we have three different categories, so we create three different columns. So whenever an observation meets that cr uh, category, we'll give it a one in the corresponding column and we'll give it zero in the other ones. So because this car is from the USA, it gets a one over here and zero over here. This car's from Europe, so you get a zero over here and a one over here and so on and so forth. So that's pretty straightforward and we like fix the formatting when we, uh, we'll edit the formatting in a second, so don't worry about the slides. Uh, now the, now it's important noting that even when you have categorical variables that have like numeric values, you need to change them to, you need one hot encoding to change them into like zeros or ones because if you didn't, your model would treat these as like weights. So going back to homeworks five and six, for example, well, one of the uh, one of the categorical variables we had that was really useful in your model was overall quality. And that basically ranked the quality of the house from like one to 10. But in your model, you don't actually want to use the values one from 10 because then you'd be assigning a higher weightage in your model to houses that have the, had the observations nine or 10 that is actually relevant. Instead, you'd want to create like 10 columns from like one through 10. And then for each, each house, you'd record whether, like if it was one, then you'd put a one in the ones column and zero everywhere else. If it was the, the overall quality of the house was three, you'd put a one in the threes column and then zero everywhere else. 
So even in the case where you already have numeric values for your categorical variables, the odds are you will need one hot encoding to change them into a binary zero or one. Uh, in terms of notation, I just want you guys to see what it looks like when we have like one hot encoding going on. So this is like a model where you account for all, if we had, me if we were only trying to predict something, like let's say, uh, predict something based on what kind of meat we're working with, and your meat could take three different categories, then this is what your model would look like. You'd have a model weight assuming the meat was beef, you'd have a different model weight if it was chicken, you'd have a different model weight if it was fish. But now let's go back to why we were doing, why we introduced feature engineering in the first place. We were trying to make sure, we were trying to ensure that our feature matrix was, was, in, was invertible, right? We didn't want it to be not invertible because that'd be a problem. However, in the case that I just showed you of one hot encoding where we had a column for every single different category you could take, if you had all those columns and you also had a bias term, then you would have linearly dependent columns. And why is that a problem? So from like linear algebra, you know, if the columns of a matrix are linearly dependent, then that matrix is not invertible. So right now, even though one hot encoding is fixing the issue of like model weights and fixing the issue of categorical variables, we are now dealing with the issue that our matrix still isn't invertible. So there's a fairly straightforward fix to that. We just drop the last column. So now you can still infer whatever you need to. So right now we remove the column for Japan, right? So the question becomes, how do we know something was in Japan or not? So if we know that something originated in the USA, then we know it automatically didn't originate in Japan. But more importantly, if it didn't originate in USA or Europe, then by extension, we also know that originated in Japan. And in terms of being able to get uh, this column for origin equals to Japan in terms of linear operations, if we, if we had the bias term, then your origin equals to Japan column would just be your bias term minus the sum of these two columns. Because wherever there was like a one over here, you'd end up with a zero here. But if the sum of both these columns for a given row is zero, then you get one minus zero and you get one over here. So even if, even though we've gotten rid of the origin equals Japan column, we still know exactly what the value is every time because we already have the bias term. So we haven't lost any information, uh, but we have lost a column, which is ties into linear dependence and linear independence. So now that we've dropped the column, we still have all the information, but the good news is we now, it's now an invertible matrix. So now our theta hat works. Like if we were to give it a feature matrix that we had used one hot encoding on, we would be able to convert our categorical variables to variables uh, like quantitative numeric variables that make sense to our model. And if on top of that, we dropped the last column, then our model would also be able to, our model would also be able to calculate theta hat by inverting this matrix. I should add like dropping the last column is a convention but anything I said could be generalized to origin equals uh, to either of the other columns because you'd still be able to get these columns back from a linear combination of your bias column uh, and the other remaining columns. Now, we've talked about invertibility uh, in terms of trying to achieve it, but it turns out it's computationally expensive, so we don't actually go through with it. So, sorry about that. This is me. This is you guys. So what do we do instead? So this is where gradient descent comes into play. So let's look at our linear regression model, right? We have our theta zero here, our theta one here, theta two, so on and so forth. If we wanted to just find the best model weight for a given covariate, what would we do? We would want to assume the rest of the model is constant or not changing. And then you try to find the model weight that gives you the lowest error or minimizes your loss for that specific covariate, right? Does that make sense to people? But if, but once you do that for one, co one covariate or like for one model weight, you'd want to move on to the other one. So in the end, you'd be, uh, you'd be treating the rest of the model as constant. Then you'd find a way to minimize your loss with respect to a specific, uh, for a specific model weight, and then you move on to the next one. But that basically means you'd be taking a partial derivative of your entire model with respect to your model weight each time, equating that to zero, and then solving for that. That's what you do each time. But if you take the partial derivative with respect to each model weight each time, what you're basically doing is you're taking, you're taking the grade, you're basically getting the gradient of that function. So this is a gradient vector over here. 
And as you can see, the gradient vector just comprises the partial for for a model vector for model weights, a vector of model weights theta, your gradient vector uh, is going to be the partial derivative of your entire model with respect to each different model weight in theta. So over here, you'd first take the partial derivative with respect to theta zero, then with theta one, so until you get to theta p, which is your final weight in your, which is your final weight in theta. So in terms of implementing, so what we'd be doing is you'd want to take the gradient, you'd want to set, you'd want to equate your gradient to zero, and then you'd want to find, uh, and then you'd want to solve for your gradient vector. So that's where the idea of, so to actually go about this, that's where the idea of gradient descent comes into play. And before we focus on the specific math of the algorithm, I just want to give you a general idea. So here we've plotted our loss against our theta, right? And over here, it's pretty easy to see that if we start up at this green point, we want our theta to increase. We want it to go here so that we, so we can move towards the minimum. But instead, if we were over here, we want to move towards the left. We want to move to the minimum over here, right? That much is straightforward. So now we have, now we know what direction we want our theta to move in. And we can figure that out based on the gradient because over here we have a negative gradient like this is a downward sloping line over here and so if it's a negative gradient you want to increase your theta over here you have a positive gradient which means you want to decrease your theta and so based on that that's how we get our general algorithm for gradient descent so as you guys have already seen before this tells you how to if you already have a value of theta this tells you how to compute the next value of theta so the next value of theta is going to be your current value of theta minus uh, Essentially, you compute the gradient of the loss and then you subtract for the other direction. Uh, you subtract in the other direction and you have a learning rate, which is basically like a tuning parameter to scale how much you're changing your theta by. So for a very large alpha value, you, you could, you'd move your theta would move a lot in a single iteration. And for a smaller alpha value, it would, your theta would move a whole lot less. So... Yeah, that's our general algorithm for gradient descent. Like I said, you actually, you need to know what theta is at least in your first iteration to be able to run this. Uh, that's not a problem because you can just set like your model weights theta all to zero if you want, or alternatively, if you have a specific guess you may want to make, like you have an idea of what range it might line, then you can fill in those values or you can just randomize your values of theta in a specific range and run it from that. But having a starting point is not difficult. So I, you can run this algorithm for like a fixed number of iterations. Alternatively, you can run it uh, until your gradient, uh, as long as your gradient is higher than a specific value. So over here, we'll notice that the gradient here is zero, right? So if our gradient is almost next to zero, then we know when you're the minimum and we can stop it. Or alternatively, if your, if your theta values aren't really changing from each iteration, that probably means we're around here because a lower gradient would mean uh, a, this entire term would be lower, so your theta would barely be changing. So there are multiple different conditions at which point you could decide that you're done with your gradient descent. And circling back, you guys might be wondering why I was talking so much about uh, linearly dependent columns or linearly independent columns if we're going to, off, uh, in the context of our feature matrix, if we're just going to be running gradient descent anyway. So uh, Sam already covered this in, in this in his slides, but the general idea is that if you have like linearly in linearly dependent columns, then you can then the model weights are somewhat interchangeable. But that's a, a problem for us because we want to associate a specific model weight with a specific uh, feature or specific covariate. So we want to eliminate that even in the context of gradient descent. Oh, and just one thing I decided I wanted to add. When you go back to one hot encoding, so now we're gonna end, so we had three different theta parameters, right? One for USA, one for Europe, and one for Japan. So now that we've dropped the column, we're only going to have two values of theta, uh, one for USA and one for Europe. But they basically, like as written over here, now the model weight corresponding for USA can be interpreted as change in miles per gallon between USA and Japan. So, which, if you don't understand exactly how this works, the general idea is that now your model weights account for the fact that there's a missing column, but, and, but you know what the value of the column would have been and your model weight accounts for it. So that's not something you really have to concern yourself with. Going back to gradient descent, 
now that we have the general algorithm that like two main kinds of gradient descent you can run so batch gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent the difference is that for batch gradient descent so the only differences are over here and over here and so what this is basically telling you for batch gradient descent is you compute like your uh, the gradients of your loss functions for the entire data set in the case of batch gradient descent and you use that to decide how you're going to move your uh, theta and in comparison for stochastic gradient descent you just pick a single vector and you compute the gradient of the loss function for that specific vector and you use that to decide how you're going to update your theta and so they have their, they both have their pros and cons so when it comes to stochastic gradient descent the biggest con is you, know, you might be wondering how are we going to get it right each time if you're just picking a vector at random and the answer is we don't in fact get it right each time but we generally tend to move in the right direction and because we're only taking one vector instead of the entire data set in the case which is the case of the batch gradient descent we are so much faster because we're taking just a singular vector that even though batch gradient always moves in the correct direction uh, and requires few, uh, fewer iterations we still end up preferring stochastic gradient descent because it's going to be a lot faster in terms of runtime because even if sometimes we go in the wrong direction we eventually end up with the right one uh, and so before we conclude our discussion on gradient descent I just want to add that you can't use gradient descent for every kind of function the, it works only if you uh, only in the context of convex functions the interest of time I can't really go into them but the main issue is that for a convex function a local minimum is also a global minimum so if you found if this was a convex function you know that if you found this minimum this is also the minimum across the entire data set but if it's a non-convex function that means the local minimum you find may not be the global minimum and gradient descent only finds a local minimum so gradient descent always finds a local minimum in the specific case of a convex function that local minimum is also the global minimum so it finds the global minimum in that case but in general if it's not a convex function you can't use gradient descent because you you might stop at a local minimum that's not the global minimum and that might give you a vastly different theta vector from the, the model weights that you're actually looking for so that's always a constraint to bear in mind if you're trying to figure out the conditions for convex functions uh, there are multiple different ways uh, that Sam covered in his slides, so I'd recommend checking those out. The ones that I remember are that it should have a non-negative second derivative throughout if, it's, it, if it can be differentiated twice. And a simpler version is that if you draw a line between two points on the function, uh, the function should never be, uh, the function should always be below that line. So that's uh, convexity. So now we can move to the bias variance trade-off. And so to understand bias variance trade-off, you just want to understand what your model risk is. Your model risk is like the expected loss um, for all the input and output points in the population. So like every different model and for all your input output points, the expected loss across all of that is your risk. And your risk is something you want to be minimizing. And over here, we talk about risk instead of just loss because we're talking about multiple models. Like you talk about loss in the context of a specific model, but now we're talking about all possible model fits. So we want to move on and generalize to risk. So your risk has three main terms. It has your model bias, your model variance, and irreducible error. So by definition, if irreducib irreducible error is irreducible, so it's not something we really concern ourselves with there's always going to be some noise or some irreducible error in our data. We, what we want to try to do is deal with our model bias and our model variance. Now, in a perfect world, you'd be able to simultaneously reduce both, or like you could just reduce bias and variance independently of the other and just try to minimize them both, and that would give you your lowest risk. But unfortunately, depending on like the loss function you're using and depending on how you're computing risk, you get different bias variance decompositions but the overall trend is that increasing one decreases the other or like decreasing one increases the other so there's no way that you can just uh, increase uh, you, there's no way you can just decrease variance without also increasing bias what you can hope for is to decrease your variance or bias in such a way that the increase in bias or variance uh, is offset and you end up with a lower risk that's the general idea for the bias variance trade-off <clears throat>
So uh, <laughs> there are multiple different bits of theory we need to focus on here. Uh, I guess you want to talk about uh, bias and variance first. So like actually understand what those terms are. So a model is said to be unbiased if it is able to fit the population model. So if it follows the general trend of the data. So over here, this model is in fact unbiased because you can see it clearly adapts to the trend in data we have here. In comparison, this straight line, it doesn't really seem to, the function doesn't really seem to be changing value based on the data points that we observe over here. So this model does seem to be biased. But in terms of variance, you want mod, uh, models with high variance have different fits for the same data. What does that really mean? So this model, uh, we can see that it's biased and it's not really following the trend of the data, but a straight line, like even if you change around, like even if you had a different straight line, it wouldn't look too different from what we have here, right? Just because it, uh, it, and it's, um, just has a linear term, there's uh, no higher order terms to worry about, it's a straight line isn't really going to look too different from an other straight line for the same data set, right? But with this, this is like a high degree polynomial. So you could easily fit, like you could easily have a different polynomial, um, like of the same degree that would, that could, that would be vastly different. And so model variance basically refers to the idea of having uh, like how different your models are from one another for like the similar or same data. And in general, high degree polynomials, because they're like high degree, if changing around the data points a little bit would change around the model a lot. So we can see that our model over here, it passes through all our points. So let's say this was our training set, but if we had a test set and we tried applying this model that we've trained on this training set to that test set, unless our test set was pretty much the exact same as our training set, we'd have a very high loss because let's just say we had a point over here like you can already see that uh, the difference between our prediction and the actual value would be pretty substantial. In comparison, uh, we're not really fitting the data here quite well, but the loss isn't huge at any point. So this is bad and this is bad. So the correct answer is probably somewhere in the middle, right? You want to, to have, uh, you want to be more unbiased than this. You want a model that actually adapts to your, to the trend in your data, but you also want it to be like kind of low variance because you don't want it to be too sensitive to your training data. And so in having covered like how bias and variance work, we can proceed in terms of evaluating models. So this is a simple model, like we already discussed, it's pretty biased because it doesn't fit the trend, but it is low variance because other straight lines would be fairly similar to this model. So this is a very simple model. Uh, in comparison, this is a complex model because it has a low bias, uh, because of its complexity, but it also has a high variance because of its complexity. So uh, it's pretty intuitive that this is, it, I, at least to me, I think it's pretty intuitive that this is the simple model and this is the complex model, but now you can actually evaluate those models in terms of bias and variance. And so having understood all these terms, we can now move on to underfitting and overfitting. So underfitting is caused by high bias. Which model do we have high bias in? Over, it's the R simple straight line model. So underfitting, uh, caused by high bias, another way of interpreting it is that let's say there's, some, uh, there's an underlying trend in the data that we're just not fitting here. That's pretty clear to see, right? Our model just doesn't really care what the points are telling it. It just continues on with a straight line. But on the flip side, we have overfitting, which we've discussed a lot, like overfitting your training data and how you want to avoid that and why your test error is always greater than your training error. So overfitting is caused by high variance, but another way of looking at it Overfitting, as we already talked about, there being some irreducible error, right? Our total risk consists of model bias, model variance, and irreducible error. So overfitting is when your model starts fitting the noise in the data instead of the actual trend. So these data points we observe, they aren't just a trend, that the general trend our data came from with some random noise thrown in. And obviously in a perfect world, we would find a way to fit exactly the trend and somehow completely, ex uh, completely ignore the noise. Realistically, that's not going to happen. You are probably going, your model is probably going to interpret some of the noise as the actual trend in the data and fit to that. And that is what overfitting is. Overfitting is when you fit that noise instead of fitting the, the underlying trend that you're aiming for. Um, and this is, yeah, this is just a summation of uh, specific cases or like specific choices which you encounter in the bias variance trade-off.
So obviously, if you have a useful feature, it'll decrease the bias in your model because now you'll start fitting the trend better because now you have this feature to help account for that. So that uh, uh, adding a good feature decreases bias, but adding any sort of feature whatsoever will increase your model complexity and by extension, it'll increase your model variance. So you should only be adding, so you shouldn't add features for the heck of it. You should only be adding features you think will actually help your model. Like if you have a reason to think they'll help your model. Uh, now we have noise in our test set and our training set. So in the context of our test set, the noise only affects the irreducible error, but in the context of our training set, it affects bias and variance. Uh, so training er and because the noise in the training set affects bias and variance, our model will try fitting to that. And that's the idea of overfitting, right? You overfit to the noise. So when you try computing your, calculating your error or your accuracy for your training set, it's going to be higher in the case, uh, it's going to be lower, your error is going to be lower and your accuracy is going to be higher in the context of your training set because they'll be overfitting in terms of fitting that noise. But once you actually get to your <laughs> test set, uh, the only noise is the irreducible error and your model is, doesn't really account for that. That's why your test error is always higher. Um, yeah, that's why your test error is always higher. Unless, uh, unless we actually have regularization, which we'll come to in a second. So bias variance trade-off is just something that should always be at the back of your mind whenever you're trying to make like other decisions. Like it's generally not something we actively consider as a, a separate step in the process. It's more like always running in the background. And to see what that means, uh, we're going to move on to cross-validation. So this is pretty much like the simple validation model. This is pretty much this very straightforward idea. You have your entire sample, you split it up into your training set, your validation set, your test set. Your training set you use to fit your model. It doesn't really, uh, yeah, you use it to fit a model. Your validation set, if you have multiple models that you've trained, you use your validation set to like choose a model, you'll choose the one with the lowest validation error. And then your test set uh, actually represents how accurate your model is in the real world, right? That's the general idea, but we might not always have enough data to have both a training set and a validation set. Like if you have few enough data points, you don't want to split up, have all three different sets. Like you definitely need your test set because you need to see, you need to see how your model does without overfitting, but you want a way to kind of like lump your training set and validation set together. And another problem is that our validation error may not always represent true risk which you want to deal with by computing multiple validation errors for each model. And so the question becomes, how do we tackle both these problems ideally at the same time? And that's where cross-validation comes into the picture. The idea for cross-validation in general is that you have, uh, let's say sets one and set two. Set two is your test set. You just take that out at the beginning and you don't worry about it. Your set one comprises both your training data and your uh, no your tra your training set and your validation set, but there's no clear demarcation that throughout you know, the process that oh this is my training data and this is my validation data. Like whether a point is used for validation or training varies. So that's a general idea for cross validation. Let's look at it specifically in the context of k-fold uh, cross validation. So now we have the instructions over here. Honestly, it's easier if you just look at the image. So like I said, uh, you have your sample, you split, you split your test set and you just stop worrying about it. Now you have the rest of your sample, which is going to be both your training set and your validation set, depend, uh, depending on the iteration. So let's just say that we had um, your rest of sample comprised sets A, B, and C, okay? This one is like up here is A, in the middle is B, at the end over here is C. So in the first fold, you choose your set A as your validation set and B and C as your training set. So what does that really mean? That means you're only going to use your sets B and C to train your model. Once you've trained your model, you're going to use your set A to calculate uh, like a validation error for that model. Then you're going to move on to fold two. In fold two, you're going to use your sets A and C to train your model. And then you're going to use your set B to validate it. And then in fold three, you use your sets A and B to train your model, and then you use your set C to validate it. And so in general, in n-fold validation, each, each set or each data point 
will be used as a validation set only once. Like you can see A was used as validation once, B was used as validation once, C was used as validation once. So every set is used for validation and it's used for validation exactly once. And then, and every set is used for training n minus one times. So over here, or our n or our k is three, we have three folds. And we can see that A is used for training twice, B is used for training twice, C is used for training twice. So the general idea for k-fold validation is that every data point or every set gets used for validation exactly once and gets used for training uh, k minus one times. And so every data point is used every time, but the specific, uh, but it, but it matters, but it gets used for validation only once and training for k minus one times. And so we can see that we have different validation errors, right? We're gonna, we're calculating three different validation errors but we want to evaluate the model as a whole. So the simplest method here is to just average out all these validation errors and that average out validation error represents your final validation error for that model. So everything I've just described so far is what you do for a single model. So if you have multiple models, what you do is you carry out this entire process, you compute your average validation error and then you compare all your different average validation errors and the model that has the lowest average validation error is the model you choose. And then to compute the actual accuracy of that model, you would be using your test set. But that's the general idea for uh, K-fold cross-validation. And over here, you can see these steps. I hope they make sense to you now. Like, I think it's probably easier to think of them in terms of the diagram, and then you'll just see that the words match up to it. Uh, these are just some general, this is just like a general overview. You want to pick like 5 or K, uh, yeah, K is 5 or 10 in general, but that's more arbitrary than a specific choice. Uh, these are some of the advantages with cross-validation. The obvious disadvantage is that because you're uh, iterating through every time and you have a different test set, validation set, you train your model, then you compute the error, then you average it out, then you move on to the next model. All of that can be computationally expensive, but this is a really useful tool when you want to compute multiple validation errors to choose the best model and also when you don't necessarily have enough data to have a separate training set and a separate validation set. That's how cross-validation works. Just to specify, cross-validation is what you, is useful in the context of model selection. So let's say you had a quadratic model, then you had like a linear model, then you had like a logarithmic model and you weren't sure which one to pick, you can run cross-validation uh, you could run cross-validation to pick which of those three. And so that's how, that's why cross-validation is useful. It's useful in terms of model selection. So having covered that, we can now move on to regularization. Uh, I'll try to go through this really quickly. The idea is that you want to penalize complex models because those have like, uh, those can have really high variance. So you want to penalize that complexity. There are two different ways of penalizing. Your L2 will penalize the the sum of the square of your model weights and L1 will penalize the sum of the absolute value of your model weights. Uh, yeah, that's the general idea. A couple of like, a couple of conceptual questions uh, to answer, uh, a couple of conceptual questions to answer regarding regularization. We don't end up penalizing the bias term. So you can see we start penalizing from the first covariate model weight. The answer is why do we want to do that? It's because the bias term doesn't actually add any complexity to our model, so it's not something we want to be penalizing. Uh, when it comes to regularize, regularizing our model, we want to normalize our data. Why do we want to do that? It's because uh, it's because uh, you want to look at things in terms of like standard units or how they compare to the rest of the data set. Like just because uh, something has really high values doesn't necessarily mean it's like an outlier or has a really high model weight. That just might be this, the data set you're working with. So you want to normalize your data first for regularization to make sense. Otherwise, you would needlessly be penalizing your uh, what seems to be like a large model weight, but it, that is just like a big number with a, uh, it isn't necessarily the most complex part of your model. Uh, so a lambda is our penalty over here. Uh, both models have some uh, penalty, uh, which is non-negative. And so you just add that penalty term onto your regular loss function, and then you try minimizing the overall loss in that case. So this is a, yeah, like I said, it's a non-negative term. A higher lambda means a higher penalty. When lambda is zero, this term just vanishes, so you just get your regular loss function. In this case, you just get your squared error loss function back, and you're not doing anything new here. 
In the case of setting lambda to infinity, then basically all your model weights become zero, right? That's, uh, it's pretty easy to see that um, if this term is infinity and you're trying to minimize loss, the only way you can do that is if the entire summation is equal to zero. And the only way you can do that is if your model weights are all equal to zero. Uh, the main difference between L1 and L2 regularization, so like uh, L1 over here, L2 over here. So L1 can perform feature selection, in which case some model weights can be set to zero even for a non-infinity lambda, uh, but that doesn't happen in the case of L2. Model weights can become really small, but they won't go to zero. Uh, a good way of thinking about that is, let's say one model weight was 11, then the square of that would be like 121, right? Now let's say you, you reduced it by five, so it became six. So now your square, no, six square is 36. So you've gone down by a decent amount, but let's say you went down another five from six to one. The, uh, now your square is, uh, one square is one. So you see the difference in loss moving from 11 to six and six to five is vastly different even though you moved by five each time. So when it comes to like squaring differences, if you're trying to reduce loss, it makes sense to start worrying about the bigger terms rather than trying to go from, you'd rather go from like 10 to five than you want to go from like four to zero in terms of minimize, minimizing loss, which is why your L2 reg uh, regularization won't set your terms, any of your model weights to zero. Uh, how does lambda tie into a bias variance trade-off? So a greater lambda means uh, a greater penalty, which means a less complex model, which means lower variance, which means higher bias. So the greater the lambda, the lower the variance, the higher the bias. On the flip side, the lower the lambda, the greater the complexity, meaning greater variance, meaning lower model bias. And the last question becomes, how, if we have a different, a bunch of different lambda values we want to try out, how do we pick what the best one is? The answer to that is just cross-validation. If you could just, if you already had a specific model in mind, you could just, uh, you could just have that model with different lambdas associated with it, and you could just run cross-validation on that and choose the model with the lowest, uh, with the lowest loss for that specific uh, penalty. So that is my time. I hope that I made sense to you. If you have questions, I recommend coming to my office hours today and we'll try go for, going over it then. Thanks. Okay, so you guys just got talked at for a long time, so I'm gonna give you a two minute break. Um, but because I wasn't left with that much time, during the two minute break, if you want to work on this problem, you can go ahead. If not, that's totally fine. Like, we'll go over it after the break too. So two minute break. Oh, Sam, are we doing attendance today? Yes. <laughs> okay. What's, is it the same link? Okay. Am I right on this? What was it? Uh, add data at DS hundred. Best luck. <laughs> 
Okay, can people still hear me with the mic down here? Or should I push it up? Raise your hand if you, or, yeah, raise your hand if you can't hear me. Okay. Okay, does anyone need more time for attendance? Link is up there. Raise your hand if you want more time. Okay. Um, so, this, so I guess moving on from now, I'm going I'm to be talking about linear separability. So, the idea here is, the, the definition of linear separability is if your data is d-dimensional, meaning, for example, you have d number of features that you're using to characterize your data. If you can draw a degree d minus 1 line that separates your data, then the data is linearly separable. So what that means is like if your data has two dimensions, for example, so capital D equals 2, and if you can draw a, deg a degree 1 line, which basically just means like, like mx plus b because x to the 1 is a degree, if you can draw a line something like that that separates your data, then your data is linearly separable. So that's the definition of linear separability. And then one like kind of um, kind of true like just statement about linear separability that uh, sometimes shows up on exams is that if you don't have regularization, gradient descent will never converge on linearly separable data. And the reason for that is kind of related to this picture. Hopefully that. So here, beta just corresponds to theta. Uh, I just got this image off of Google, so I wasn't able to find something with theta, but it has beta in it. And so the idea is, if your, da if your data is linearly separable, oh, I wish I could get rid of that thing. If your data is linearly separable, then you get sort of, oh my gosh. Is there a way to turn off this thing? Hmm. I don't know. But basically, like when you're, if your data is linearly separable, you get the, uh, let's try. You get the that your your sigmoid function look, will look like this because there's an exact boundary right here that you can use to separate your data, and so the only way you can get a sigmoid that looks like this is if your input to the sigmoid is infinity, and so basically what's going to happen is since the input to your sigmoid is the output of your linear regression, your theta is going to go all the way to infinity, and so gradient descent is never going to converge because it can always choose a different theta. Okay, any questions about that part like this? This picture and how it relates to gradient descent. Okay, so that's linear separability. And so with that, I guess if you haven't tried this question, who hasn't tried this question yet? Okay, I'll give you another like one, two, uh, one minute because I'm short on time to do this question, and then we'll go over it together. And please talk to someone next to you if you don't even know how to approach this because the final is coming up soon. Okay, so if I had more time, I'd, I'd like ask around and see what people got, but since we're already low on time, I'm going to go ahead and just reveal the answer. The, the data is linearly separable, and they're separable by this, the line that, like, this equation, essentially. Phi 3, meaning this feature, x modulo 2, equals 0.5. And the way you can see that is, this modulo thing is kind of just checking whether or not the, num the x is even. And so... You know, if you notice in the data, when, whenever x is even, we say that, or y is predicted as 1, and whenever x is odd, y is pre predicted as 0. So that's kind of like they're a separating point. So if this phi 3, meaning x modulo 2, is equal to 0.5, that's kind of the middle line between 0 and 1 that separates uh, the like evens and odds data, I guess. And notice that since, since our data is one-dimensional, meaning x is just like a scalar, right? We can't have 
or the, the line that separates our data cannot have any X terms in it because our data is of degree one, so our hyperplane that separates our data has to be of degree zero, meaning x to the zero, which is just like a constant term. So that's why we like we're restricted to like only constants in, in this for this problem for the hyperplane that separates our data. Any questions about this problem? Okay. Uh, I wanted to do a quick, I don't really have any questions on Bootstrap, um, but just kind of a quick review on what the process is. So over here we have the whole population, so like ev everything you're interested in, but in general you only have access to one sample of that population. And so the idea behind Bootstrap is you take samples with replacement from this sample to create a bunch of different samples, and if your goal is to generate, is to figure out the, the distribution of some, some like metric f, we're going to call it f for now, then you can use each one of these bootstrap samples to figure out the sampling, the, like to estimate the sampling distribution of f. And the sampling distribution of f is, if, so if, if you pretend that f is like the mean, right, the mean of some, some group of things, then the sampling distribution of the mean would be if we took a bunch of samples from the original population here, so if we had a bunch of these um, like intermediate set of blocks, and so then if we took the mean of each one of those, that would be the sampling distribution of the mean. We, we generally say that it's impractical to take a bunch of samples from the population, so we instead resample the sample that we have, which we call bootstrap samples, and then compute f or the mean on all of those bootstrap samples, and we say that's our estimate of the sampling distribution of f. And we can say that because we assume that this original sample was drawn from the population randomly. If it's not drawn randomly, we can't say anything about the fact that the sample looks anything like the population. I guess as a test your understanding, why do we want to sample with replacement when we do bootstrap sampling? Anyone can just shout it out. You don't have to raise your hand. Yeah, exactly. If you sample without replacement, then you're essentially just choosing the exact same sample over and over again. You want to have some chance of getting different samples from your original sample. And the only way you can do that is, with, is if you sample with replacement. Okay, any questions about the bootstrap process or sampling with replacement? Okay. Um, I don't really I think I have, t yeah, I don't really have time for this, but uh, the slides will be, the slides are already posted so you can see it. Okay, but I did want to get quickly to Ray because it was kind of br really brushed upon. So the idea behind Ray is that um, instead of doing all of your computation, if you have like a really, 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 really big data set and you want to do something like, you want to like, I don't know, just like use a model to predict something, right? Instead of doing all the computation on one computer, you can spread that computation across a bunch of different computers and do them all at the same time. And that's called parallel computing. Um, and that's what kind of what Ray allows us to do. It allows you to use your one computer to access computers like somewhere else to do that. And so the way it does that, the way it does that is you put whatever you want to use for your computation into some magic box that Ray creates. And then when you want to use it, you get them out. And Ray does that in an efficient way for you. And so the way that works in like the actual code is to put something to the magical box, you say Ray.put x to put x into the box. And that returns you an x ID for, the, for that element x. And the reason why it returns an x ID is because when you, when you want to get x back, you say Ray, give me the object that is associated with x ID, and then it will return you x. And it does that in an efficient way. And that's the reason why like, all this stuff happens efficiently. You don't have to know how it does it efficiently, but you just know that it happens efficiently. Uh, but if you want to do this with functions, if you want to like, be able to do this efficiency thingy with functions, you have to tell Ray that whatever function it's using, has, uh, do you want to like, um, take advantage of their computers, I guess, in the background. And so the way you do that is you say, before your function, you put at Ray.remote. And then to actually use it, if you, if you put at ray.remote before some function I'm going to call func, the way you actually call that function and the way that uses Ray's efficiency is you say func.remote of your argument. And that's the same thing as saying func of argument, but now you're using Ray's like, efficient computers in the background. Okay. Any questions about... The Ray syntax is not like super important. I would say like probably just put it on your cheat sheet in case it shows up on the exam. Um, but like it's just the reason you should, you should... But the main idea is you should know that Ray takes advantage of parallel computing, which does a bunch of things at the same time, rather than one after the other. Okay, any questions about 
this syntax or what parallel computing is, like as a concept. Okay, um, go ahead and try out this question. Uh, this kind of just tests your uh, understanding of what, how, how parallel computing affects how long things take to run. I'd say take maybe two minutes to do this, or yeah, two minutes to do this. And uh, as a note, like this word serially, when we say that something is executed serially, it just means one after the other, so like in series. Okay, does anyone want more time? Raise your hand if you want more time for this question. Okay, I'll give you about 30 more seconds. Okay, let's go over this. So these are the answers. Um, sorry, it's a little bit zoomed out, but the solutions kind of took a lot of space. Uh, but for part A, right, the expected amount of time required to call this function f 10 times, if they're all executed one after the other, is 50 seconds. And why do we say that? It's because this runtime here, if we're choosing between 0 and 10 seconds, like randomly, then we expect it to be 5 seconds. And if we're doing this 10 times, we get 50 seconds, because it's 10 times in a row. But if we were doing this 10 times in parallel, then we're, and we're looking for the maximum amount of time, okay, well, we assume that, okay, maybe like the maximum amount of time is if our runtime is 10 seconds for every call to f. But if we're doing these all in parallel, then it, it, this, the amount of times that it takes f to call 10 times or 100 times or even 5,000 times is just the same time as it takes to call f one time because we're doing it all at the same time, every call to f. And so the maximum time just becomes 10 seconds. Okay. Any questions about parts A or B? Okay, and so this, I guess these notes are just because like um, the wording of the question wasn't like amazing, so they accepted other answers, but the concept remains the same. So for part C, this kind of just tests whether, like what, what, if you understand how array works. Um, if we want to compute a list of all the return values from calling f 10 times and execute all of them in parallel, we have to use the dot remote syntax because that's what tells Ray we want to use their par parallel com computing. And so we say, okay, we want to call f dot remote 10 times, so that's basically saying for, for everything in range 10, we call f.remote. That calls um, the remote 10 times. But remember that calling a function only returns you the, X, the IDs. And if you want to actually get the values associated with the IDs, you have to call ray.get. And so that's what the ray.get does out here. Okay, yeah, any questions? Okay, actually, yeah, so yeah. But any like quick questions about part C? Okay. Um, I originally had a break plan, but I don't know if we have time for the break. So, okay. Uh, I know you saw decision trees a little bit yesterday, but um, 
Manana and Stephanie told me that they didn't get a chance to go over like that many practice questions. So I'm it doesn't uh, so I'm probably going to focus more on the question side of decision trees. But if raise your hand if you still want me to go over like a conceptual review of what decision trees are. It's going to be quick because I don't have much time. But if you want another conceptual review, just like raise your hand and I'm happy to do it because I prepared for it. Okay. I see two hands. So uh, maybe like you can ask me questions after because there's only two of you because I want everyone to get like practice questions as well. So but I guess the basic idea is like we're still doing classification decision trees. We're still doing classification. We're still doing regression just a different way. And so this is an example of a decision tree. But OK. So the idea behind this or actually here, this is the process of making a decision tree, right? We start with all the training data in, in one node, and then we basically keep splitting those nodes until we've correctly classified all of our data using like the we choose a split value every time we split our data, and so that basically splits our data from one node one node to two nodes for every single node that we have until all of the data is classified correctly. Um, I was going to do an example, but we don't have time for that. OK. So at each step of this making the decision tree, we have to basically choose, we have to split our data in like the quote unquote best way. But like, we don't, like, what does that really mean? Um, and so this slide is attempting to illustrate this. So on the left side, we have one way of splitting. Our top node is here. We have 20 examples that are classified with the label D and 40 examples classified with the label B. And when I say examples, I mean like training data examples. Now on the right side, we have the same parent node. We have 20 nodes with D and 40 nodes, or 40, sorry, four, 20 examples with label D, 40 examples with label B. And so on the left side, there's, this is one way of splitting it, right? We can split into two nodes where one node has 10 with label D and 10 with label B, and the other node has 10 with label D and 30 with label B. And this is like pretty good, right? Where I guess we're, we're splitting, like, we're kind of like separating out all the Ds and the Bs a little bit. Um, but notice on the right hand side, we get the ideal split, right? We got all the D's on one side and all the B's on the other side. So that's exactly how we want to split our node because then we know exactly which way to, if we get a new training example, we can send it towards, like if it's a D, we know we can send it towards like this D node, right? And so we want to split our data the way it's split in the right tree, but we don't really, we need to like have some way of quantifying that the right tree is better so that we can like use our model to like, I guess it's, basically minimize this loss function that we're going to set. And the loss function is entropy. And so this is like basically a lot of math. But the idea here is, does entropy accomplish what we want? And what we want is for nodes, for splits that look like this to have lower entropy than splits that look like this. And so indeed, you can like verify, I think it's also in Sam's slides, that when you get like a split that looks like this, where all the nodes go to, where the nodes get perfectly split, our entropy is very low. And if you don't really split that much, your entropy is very high. And entropy always lives between 0 and 1 because you're working with probabilities. So what very low means is 0, and very high means is 1. And so I guess like I think, I think maybe Manon and Stephanie uh, went over this yesterday. But quote, like I guess TLDR, the answer to this question is yes. Uh, if we get a split that looks like this, then the entropy becomes 0. And a split looks like this, it's somewhere between 0 and 1. And since we're choosing nodes, since we're wanting to minimize this loss function, we're going to choose nodes that have lower entropy. Okay. Any questions about like the concept? The math itself, you can like work out on your own. It's just a matter of plugging certain prob like probabilities into this entropy. But as a concept, any questions about uh, entropy and what it's doing for us? Okay. And so. We still, not, we still need to figure out, okay, we have this thing called entropy, but how does that relate to what is necessarily the best split for our data? And so this is kind of just like um, some diagram that's in Word. So if we have a parent node N, and we're going to split it into two nodes like this, N1 and N2. Can anyone not see this diagram? Okay. So this is a diagram that we have. This top node has k points, as it says in the slide. And we're going to split so that this node gets k1 points, and this node gets k2 points. And so we need to define, OK, what is like, how, how bad or how good is this split? And so that's what this formula defines. S, remember, S stands for entropy. So we say, OK, we find the entropy of n1, the entropy of n2, and we take the weighted average of that. And we're going to say that is going to be the loss of this split as a whole. That's all this formula is saying down here. Okay, And so basically, that's our loss function. And we want to minimize that. And so 
what we're saying is that um, every time we consider splitting a node in our, in our uh, or every, every time we want to add a branch to our tree, we're essentially saying, let's consider every single way we could possibly split our training data the way it currently is, and then just split the data that has the lowest value for this formula right here, the loss of the split. And we keep doing that repeatedly until all of our training data is classified exactly, like perfectly. Okay. Any questions about this formula or like how it relates to, or like why is this doing what we want? Okay, and so here I have some, uh, this is kind of the questions I wanted you to get to, I wanted to get to. So we define this thing called information gain for splitting node, basically it's the same diagram. We say that, so originally we only had this node n, and we're splitting it into node n1 and n2. And if we split a node, we're essentially, we say that we can gain some information about like what, uh, how, what the pattern is in our training data. And so we have this like mathematical way of defining it as the entropy of n minus the loss of the split for this split, and we define that as the information gain. And so, two questions, or there's two, two, this, this like set of statements is true, right? The information gain is always positive, except for two cases. The first case is we split all the points into one child node, and the other case is if, we, if all the child nodes have the same PC, and PC means like the proportion of, um, proportion of data points in that node that have label C. So that's what, that's what PC means, proportion of points in that node that have label C in the training set. And that's just the second condition is if the PC is the same for all the child nodes, for all C, then the information gain is not positive. And so take like maybe, this is like kind of involved, I would say take maybe three minutes to think to yourself and also talk to your neighbors and think about why this is true. Because if you can understand why this is true, then you pretty much fully understand decision trees. So I think this is like a really good like test to know whether or not you understand data trees, or decision trees. So take three minutes, think to yourself, talk to someone else if you don't like, know how to think about this, and we'll regroup in about three minutes. And if you have any questions on like what information gain is, like just to clarify it, then you can ask me as well. Okay, does anyone want more time to think about this? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, so the the reason so information gain is always positive except in two cases. Um, so generally, like I guess, why do we say information gain is usually positive? If we ignore these two cases and we say information gain is always positive, the intuition behind that is every time we split our node, we're splitting our training data up, and so we're getting a better classifier. So we say that that means we're gaining information. So that's like in general, why information gain is positive. But then we have these two cases, right? If we split our data and all of the points from node n end up in node n1, then our information gain isn't anything, right? Because we basically just copied node n once. 
And so we're not really gaining any information because we didn't split the data at all. We just basically put all the points in node n to node n1. And so that's why this first condition is, the information is, and gain is zero here for the first condition. Any questions about condition one? OK. And then for condition two, the child, if, if we split our data such that the proportion of points that contain label C for all the labels in these the two child nodes are the exact same as the parent node, then what happens is when you go back to this entropy formula, it, if PC is the same for both the child nodes and the parent, then the entropy is the exact same. And we didn't really do a good job of splitting up the data because that proportion of data points is exactly the same for the parent and the child nodes. So we didn't gain any information because we didn't split the parent node into like, or we didn't do a good job of splitting. So that's why the information gain is also zero for condition two. Any questions about condition two? OK. So um, I guess just to finish out, we have this. So the, the problem with decision trees is we don't stop training until all the data points are classified correctly in the training set. And because of that, we have 100% training accuracy. Um, I think Manana and Stephanie covered this yesterday. So I'm kind of just going to gloss over that. If you have questions, talk to me after. But the way we solve this is we do this thing called random forest, which is this algorithm that's laid out here. I think Manana and Stephanie also covered it. But the idea is instead of just creating one decision tree, we're going to create a bunch of decision trees. But we don't create the decision trees based on all of the features. For each decision tree, we choose a random subset of our features and we train a decision tree on just those fe using just, just those features. And we do that multiple, or I guess in this case, we do it T times, capital T times. And then, so we have the, at the end of all this, we have T different decision trees. And to make our prediction, we take the prediction of all the T decision trees. And for classification, we take the majority vote. Uh, and then for regression, we take the average value. But we're going to stick with class classification because it's a little bit easier to understand the concept. Okay, any questions about just the general process of random forest? I have like one more question about random forest, and then that'll be it. Okay, if there are no questions, this is a, just, I copied and pasted the like algorithm for uh, random forest, and these are the two questions. How does M affect the bias and variance of our model? Remember, random forest is just a model that we're using to do regression or classification, so it still has bias and variance. And the same question for T. And remember, M is the number is, I kind of bolded it here, it's the number of features that we use to train each decision, or each decision tree. And T is the number of trees that we have in our forest. So maybe take, uh, let's see, it's 10.59. Take one minute to uh, think about this on your own or talk to someone next to you, and then I'll quickly go over it. Okay, does anyone want more time? Raise your hand to think about this. Okay, so, okay, I guess it looks like I, the, I think I forgot to put like the answer in the, in the actual slides, but the idea here is for M, M is the number of features that we're using to train each tree, right? So if we use more features, then each tree is gonna look more like the decision tree we had previously that had, that was overfitting. So if we use more features, we still overfit, and that means we have high variance. And Conversely, that also means we have um, like a lower bias because we're overfitting essentially to our training data. Okay, any questions about how M affects bias and variance? Like, arguably, that's like the easier one to understand. But for T, so if we train more trees, 
right? Then we're essentially saying that um, we're taking the average over a lot of different trees that are trained on different subsets of features. And so we say that our variance decreases because we're kind of getting different snapshots of our training data in terms of the features. And so if we take the average over a bunch of different trees, that's going to decrease our variance because we're not overfitting on any one of those trees. Okay, so it decreases variance when we increase t. And so I guess conversely means we increase bias when we, when we increase t. And the reason for that is um, when we increase the number of trees, remember since each tree is only trained on a subset of the features, each tree itself is not going to do a great job of actually like predicting the training set because it's not using all the features. And so if we increase the number of trees, then we're kind of like getting farther and farther away for the accuracy on our training set. But we trade that off because we're doing better on sets we haven't seen before. Okay, any questions about how T affects bias and variance? Okay, uh, that's pretty much it for me. Those are some like uh, advice that I have. I would say if you really like are strapped for time, focus on the spring 2019 and fall 2018 exams because those are like more representative of what you're going to see on the final on, on Thursday. Again, don't stay up all night. Like, I, if you're in my section, like, I've probably said this multiple times, like, if you don't know something right, that's like, like at 4 a.m. the night of the test, like, it's better to just sleep because then you have, you're not, you're going to forget everything else that you learned if you don't sleep. Um, and the most important thing is go into the final with a positive attitude because, like, trust me, like, from experience, if you're not confident that you're going to do something, there's, like, almost zero chance you're going to actually do that something. But if you just fake it and be like, yes, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do well, like, you're going to do a lot better. Okay. Good luck on the final. Thank you again for being a great class. Um,